Welcome to Wine Talks with Paul Kay, and we are in the studio today with Soren Christensen from the Hearst Winery. Of course, Wine Talks is always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, where we're supporting the new pure and dynamic wine club called the Pure Wine Series. And you can find Wine Talks on Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and Pandora soon. But we're not here to talk about Wine Talks. We're here to talk about wine, and we're here to talk about a little history and have some fun with Soren Christensen. Welcome to the studio. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. You drove all the way down just for me, huh? That was awfully nice of you. We did, indeed. It got, <laughs> so, got me out of the winery for a little bit, so I'm okay with it. Well, which is kind of which is kind of problematic because didn't you just harvest? We did, yeah. We have two tanks left on ferments right now, so some Cab Franc and some Petit Verdot, but we're kind of at towards the tail end, so I could get away for a day. And they don't they don't miss you because that's not they a good thing. Nah, if they don't miss good. you, then you know why do we need you? No I'm kidding. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. No, we're uh, we're predominantly pressed off. We have a lot in barrel already, so. It feels good to be towards the end here because it's a long, long slog. When, when, since now you're on the, now I've been to Hearst Castle, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I think I've seen the building for the tasting room off the Highway One there, um, but this is called the cool side of Paso Robles, right? This is the west side. Or are you on the east side? We're on the east side. Oh, okay, so I got that wrong. I had a 50-50 shot at that. And Nailed I didn't it. Get that Nailed right. it. Yeah. <laughs> Why, I don't know, because I already <laughs> asked you this, and you already answered it. Uh, you're, so you're on, the, you're on the hot side, on the, 50, on the 46 highway side air, near the airport, right? Yes, but we're right along the riverbed. So, I mean, the delineation between east and west is typically the Salinas River and or Highway 101. Yes. And our property starts at the Salinas River moving east. So it's not like we're way out on the far east side near Shandon or something. We're just just to the east side of the river. So like how far from Lake Nascimento? Actually, I'm, I could make up a number. As the crow flies, not terribly far. Exactly how far, I couldn't tell you. Oh, good, but okay. it's not that far. San Miguel with a thriving metropolis. Is that the place? Ab- if you're looking for <laughs> meth or a tattoo, that's your <laughs> yeah, place. That's right. As I tell my <laughs> wife, I said, more than San Miguel to go to Nordstrom's. So yeah, right. So, <laughs> so well, we, we, I think I told you when we were tasting, uh, we had property for a while on that side. You would take Australia River Road, but was Australia River, It's is it dry? Is it always dry? It's seasonal for sure. Oh, it is. There's yeah, water I mean, it's, it's dry the great majority of the year but if we have a big rainfall it's a pretty good sized watershed so all of a sudden it'll just be this raging torrent of water for a week at a time and, oh, really? and people will get stuck in it yeah, and then yeah it drains out pretty quickly <laughs> i never saw i never saw water and, it would, and we had the property on about five or seven years and I, I bought it at the time when no one was buying then thinking i was going to retire there build a house and uh it just didn't happen and then i i couldn't tell my wife and so she, i know she doesn't listen to the show so i can tell you <laughs> Uh, we found some like Indian bones, like when we were digging stuff up. And so I'm like, if I told my wife that there's potentially Indian burial grounds here, I'm in big trouble. So I just said, you know what, let's just sell it. Turned it into a beach house in Hermosa Beach, so that was okay, right? Yeah, I think you did just fine. But this was this was an odd piece of property, just off subject for a second. But we drive down Australia River Road, you head toward the airport from wherever Australia River Road hits Highway 46, and there was this U-shaped street called Magnolia martingale circle and it was a 300 acre ranch that they had chopped up into 10 parcels of 30 acres and then it went bankrupt okay so then they were selling off the parcels and i happened to get the parcel for some reason they had the main well which as you understand the water and pass absolutely yeah Uh, so it was doing like 600 gallons a minute this thing and everybody else has got like 150 and I got this giant thing in the middle of my property. Of course, there's a tractor and a dilapidated car, and there's tires everywhere. <laughs> but <laughs> what was interesting was uh, the CCNRs were still in place. So the insurance company that was funding this thing had all this stuff produced for the county. One of the a couple of the rules were this: no cars allowed on the property unless it's on some kind of slab, asphalt or concrete. No dilapidated RVs. No tractors, you know, rusting in the corner. No uh, foil on the windows. That was delineated. <laughs> and no exposed uh, laundry on the... Okay, so I don't know what they were thinking, but... Anyway. And you chose Hermosa Beach over that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I wanted a whack job. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so I want to hear about what, what you were doing. Soren Christensen is, is um, Danish. Right? It is a, it's a very Danish name, but actually by heritage, I'm mostly Italian. Go figure. Really? It's, the name comes from my dad's side, but I, yeah, he was, a, he was a, a quarter Danish. My mom's half Italian, so that end wins out. Is this a 23andMe thing that you did? That's, well, that's how I got my nose. So, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, we're in the same boat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, so the Danish part, does it, uh, you, you're not going to give it credit for the, uh, 
uh, tasting palate or the uh, wine making skills. I'm, I'm not in the least. And actually, we still have some family there. My wife and I went to visit. And I, I mean, my name is extremely <laughs> Danish. So we check into the hotel in Copenhagen. And the guy just starts chattering like the Swedish chef from the Muppets. And I have no freaking clue what he's saying. Okay. I was just like, I'm an American. <laughs> okay, sorry. That's so funny. And they the, see us all the time. The old burnt, the sunburnt palms are too. Yeah, right? yeah. So maybe, the, maybe your affinity towards uh, making wine is really um, the Italian side. I'd like to say that, but my mom still drinks crap. Oh, it's, yeah, well, that's not good. No, it, it really, uh, <laughs> I don't have some... Is that uh, the name of the wine that she yeah, drinks or just the Yeah, style? exactly. It's on sale at Rite Aid. <laughs> I don't have some amazing like romantic story. Really, it was it was uh, I had this amazing opportunity after college. I, I didn't know the direction I was going to go, but I fell into it, seized hold, and I've never let go. It's a great industry to fall into. I got to tell you. Yeah, this well, I I think, and that's some of the questions I like to ask is going to be this passion that you developed from doing that. But you were in college. Uh, were, you, were you born in LA? I mean, I born was, in no, I was, California. I was born near San Francisco. Okay, yep, raised so, there my whole life. I went to school down in Fullerton, actually, not too far from here. Really? Yeah, Cal State. Fullerton. I was, I was hoping to throw the javelin in the Olympics one day, but my an injury failed my career. Okay, so. this is bizarre because my old trainer, for a little while now, probably since you've been gone, was the javelin trainer down there. What's his name? Uh, his name was uh, uh, Brent Legacy. Okay, yeah, that's... and now he's a. Uh, uh, he still thinks he's gonna get the Olympics, and now he's <laughs> coaching the school. He probably <laughs> wasn't born when I was there. Huge dude, though. I mean, yeah. this guy. Gotcha, so gotcha. You could chuck this thing, right? You could chuck it. I could, yeah. I, actually, in junior college, I won my uh, my conference. Really? So I could chuck so it. So they had junior college. Yeah, up in Northern California. Wow. Well, I don't think it would have hurt somebody down here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you get out of college, what do you see an ad in the paper or something? Or? No. So my, uh, my, my wife, we were dating at the time and she was finishing up school at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So I, uh, I was madly in love and still am, I'm happy to say. So I moved up to San Luis Obispo. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> after, after college, I moved to San Luis Obispo and she gently suggested I get a job after a while. So I got a job at a winery and it just happened to be harvest season. So uh, as I notated, my mom and my dad didn't drink anything of note. So I, I didn't really have any experience with wine. But it was just a really fun job, super physical, shoveling tanks, sweeping floors, dragging hoses. And uh, by the time my wife graduated, my girlfriend at the time, that is, uh, I love my job. And I stayed at that first winery for 11 years. This is Hope. This is Hope Family Wines. Which yeah. is the gorgeous wines too. Now they have, last time I was there, they had a beautiful little tasting room that they built. I don't know if that's new. There, Yeah, there's one on the back side of their property, kind yes. of on the way. Um, yeah, you have to road. kind of get off the road to get yep. there. Yeah. Yep. yep. Wonderful lunch we had there. Good people, yeah, for yeah. sure. I learned a great deal there. So you've been around Paso then for what? It's yeah, a little over twenty years. Yeah. I mean, I'm to the point now where I'm like the old guy. That's like, oh, it's changed so yeah, much yeah, since yeah, I've so been there. The old guy, yeah, get your walker with you. <laughs> um, okay, that's interesting because Paso, uh, you know, it's still pretty rural, and it's and I, when people ask about the wine country, uh, most of the people realize that that Napa is pretty commercial, and Sonoma is still pretty rural, but Paso's still got that wonderful cowboy, you know, they still have the, the rodeo, and uh, it doesn't seem to have changed that much, except for the number of wineries. It's, but do you feel different, or is it, it is the social side has changed, the, the stigma of the wines? I, yes, to all of the above. Uh, I mean, the downtown is unrecognizable, yes. and, and some would say in a good way, and others may say it's a little bit too commercial now, but yeah, the downtown has is, is changed incredibly, so we... When we first moved in, we bought a, a piece of crap house that might have been on that property. That <laughs> a lot of crap going on. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> so, my wife and I would get home from our day job, and we'd you know be tearing down drywall or pulling wire or something. Oh wow! And then try to go get dinner at eight o'clock on a weeknight, and we were just out of luck. I mean, we could go to Taco Bell if we wanted, but there was nothing open. And now there's you know on any given weeknight, you can get reservations after nine o'clock at night, which that's it's bizarre. Past, it's past my bedtime, I, but I yeah. Think I think even in 2004, I think when we bought this property, it was kind of like that. Yeah. There was a whole lot to That's go That's right through. around the same time frame. So, yeah, I mean, now it's we have the number of fine dining options are just through the roof. It was McPhee's was the only one everybody ever knew and about. And that's it. even in Templeton. Yeah, yeah. In Templeton, So, yeah. now around the square, I mean, you can walk around and, and find a dozen great restaurants. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, it's fun. Um, the bowling alley. The bowling alley is still, <laughs> still there. It's still there. <laughs> okay, something bizarre. I, I, I'm a, I, I love the – I don't bowl, really. But, the, but it's so Americana to me, you know, long neck buds and, and uh, fiberglass seats and the concept just intrigues me. I love bowling machines. I've got I have had a dozen of them at one time. I've sold most of them. But um, that one was a classic. And I was up there buying the property for the vineyard. And I get back home and I'm talking to this guy, a random friend. I don't know him that well. We just acquaintance. And he goes, yeah, I'm looking at a bowling alley in Paso Robles. I'm like, what? Because <laughs> it was for sale at the time. I don't know if they've 
done anything with it, but it's still functioning. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So there is, have you ever heard of Hospice de Rhone or Hospice de Rhone? Yeah, 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 sure. So it's, it, it was this flourishing event we had for the longest time where yeah. they'd get these premium producers of Rhone wines coming over from the Rhone Valley and, and people doing Garnacha and whatnot from Spain and from all over the world. And was it Thursday night, Mark? Off camera, I know that's good. Yeah, no Maybe problem. it was the Thursday night event was Ronin Bowl. And it's hilarious because you have a bunch of guys that look like Mark that have never even <laughs> seen a bowling ball in their life with purple and teeth like and him. purple lips. And they're all out there bowling. It's okay, like, oh, hilarious. Jean-Pierre, you nailed it. Jean-Pierre, yeah. that's a very famous name so of the Ronin bowling bowl. circles. Paso Robles may have been the first to combine Ronin oh, wow. and bowling. Uh, it must perhaps. be. Yeah. All right, so we're going to talk about that. So the Rhone varietals, uh, the Grenache Syrahs are mostly West Side, right? Typically? Uh, I, I mean, mean like yes and no. the Creek kind of thing and... Yes, a lot of wineries of note are on the west side for sure, but I certainly don't want to discount the east side of Paso. It's no. an amazing, amazing spot area. that I don't think gets enough credit as is. You know, we bought uh, we bought sixty acres, and the guy behind me had sixty acres, and he planted. Now this is probably early two thousand, maybe before oh four, and because that glut in oh four oh five where there's just like a ton of grapes, and if you didn't have a contract, he didn't even pick. I mean, it's just hung there and turned into raisins because there was so much there was so much stuff going on. Is that and I know that 18 was a great harvest in, in generally in California, but for sure uh, in Napa and Sonoma. And so it was 19. And how has the harvest been for, for Hearst and with, um, uh, with Paso in general? We had a fantastic year. Uh, I mean, knock, knock on wood, but I told my wife, this is one of the easier harvests I've had in a while as far as all the logistics kind of lining up nicely. Sometimes you just have to submit yourself to the gods out there. And yeah, well, that's what it is, right? When, when timing's ready to pick and if you have tanks available and, and if all the crews show up and whatnot. So we actually had a great year. I was able to get everything in, in a in. timely fashion when I wanted it. We had a crazy hard frost on November 1st. So we were all shaking off our, our candy hangover from oh, Halloween. No. November 1st, it's 21 degrees on the way into the winery. And, wow. I mean, grape vines are a fairly hardy plant, but the leaves just, they just crisp up overnight. Yes. Um, so anyone that had fruit left hanging after the first, that was, a, it makes it a little bit more troublesome because then you're trying to keep shattered grape leaves off everything. Ah, so they break. Abs yeah, just into a million so pieces. So from the grape standpoint though, because it helps reduce potential They desiccate a little things, bit, yeah. Yeah, so okay, well... Um, so good harvest going on in Paso and such hearty fruit. I've done a, a lot of Paso wines this year, actually, uh, through Broken Earth and a couple other wineries. Um, you're going to produce more this year in 19 than you produced? I tasted the 19 Malbec, which is extraordinary. Yeah, thank you. We, uh, we, did, we had a really big year in 2018. So there was a bumper crop, especially a Cab Sauvin 18. So we were able to pounce on a few uh, really nice lots yeah. that were left hanging that didn't have an owner. Yeah. <laughs> so this this year we kind of actually dialed it back a little. Does anybody bit. plant without a contract? Does it make any sense at all? <laughs> no. It well, I don't know. <laughs> it winds winds up working out well for some of us that are uh, on the winery side. So. So now you're working at Hope and uh, you're cleaning barrels and scrubbing the floors and doing whatever. Did Did you work in the wine manufacturing side at all when you were there? Or you left that and did something else. No, no. That's I did that for eleven years. So oh, okay. And so. it was just really good timing when I started there. They were. I mean, still bigger than we are at Hearst today, but smallish. Yes. And the growth was amazing in the time. So just uh, opportunities came abound for me. And I apparently either did the right thing or didn't screw up enough that they kept me on. Well, that's good. Yeah. But so what did you, did you read? Did you just watch I the did, winemaker? I and, did. And, and our sales manager in particular, a gentleman that I'm still very close with, really... He, he was very good about expanding my horizons and, and putting a austere burgundy in front of me or just a racy Australian, you know, yeah. Shiraz and, yeah. and really just kind of opening my eyes to, so I didn't develop too much of a house palette. And do you, that, do you have a, do you have like a, a, a current fascination? Like you, it's I, okay to say it's not Paso. If, don't worry. No, 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 listen to this. No, I, I well, will. I, to I don't know if it's kind of boring cause it's a real small appellation in one varietal, but I have a thing for Cornos. There's something really? about there's something about the simplicity of it. Wow. And, and Mark and I were talking about cars on the way down and the Shelby Cobra. I don't know if yeah, this is a bad analogy or not, no. but it's basically just I think Shelby's good. I have an, an engine thing. wrapped in, in in is it sheet metal or aluminum, yes, whatever. Right. But it's basically it's it's all about the experience of the car. And I feel to a certain extent that's what Cornos is like, as you have this steeply terraced hillside Syrah that is typically done in, in very old oak or old old foodras, and it's just this huh. this just muscular wine wrapped in a, in a, in a clean sheath with nothing to 
distorted. They are very firm and robust wines. That's and for I, sure. I just love that. I mean, there's simplicity, but this amazing power to it. So that is something that, I mean, certainly you tried through our wines. There's no Cornosses hiding in here, but no, that's not our fruit. No. But at the right. same time, the simplicity of it certainly informs what I do on a daily basis. So that's an ex that's an important thing you just said, because the expression of Cornosses and anything from that part of the world uh, is what it is. That's what it's supposed to be. And that's what you drink it for and why you get fascinated by it. And I'm my personal sort of fascination is Burgundy's right now, even though it's a large t swath of territory. Uh, the idea that you can go across the street and be in a different appellation and <laughs> you know experience a completely different wine, even though it's the same winemaker, the same barrels, and the same manufacturing, uh, there's such a difference in the terroir and the in the soil and everything that it makes just a fun fascination. I think that's what wine should be. So down that way, I mean, I don't, I haven't, I can't tell you the last time I tasted one. Gigondas, yes, those kinds of things, but um, not a Cornas. So where, where do you find them here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not a whole heck of a lot of them. And certainly some of the newer producers are, are utilizing more kind of new world tactics using some newer oak and yeah. smaller barrels. But just like Klopp, C-L-A-P-E, the old school, just stripped down. I mean, it's, it's, it's a expensive bottle of wine if you find it at a nice restaurant yeah. but if you've got someone with a couple of years behind it it's just delicious so i'm wondering like when you go to the restaurant you say hey, do you get any corn nuts like, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, plus you run a little risk and it just happened to me recently at a restaurant in pasadena here where i had tasted a uh, sagonatino from very well maker and sagonatino is a pretty firm grape also and it's gonna be robust and acidic and uh, i thought okay it's an 08 on the menu you know it should have some nice bottle age it shouldn't be it was totally shot really and so i'm wondering like you go into a restaurant and you something like cornas which people aren't going to ask for necessarily unless they're something like you that understands and wants to experience many different ones uh you kind of run up a risk of being you know not well preserved uh, because the wine this restaurant didn't pay attention to it who knows but have you had that experience with one of these or no no i mean just the fact that i lust after is one thing but i have two colleges <laughs> just to save for for my kids so no, i don't so exactly really go around i don't okay. go ordering it a whole heck of a lot i got two you. kids so yeah i got two 10 year old or a, a 10 year old and a seven year old boy so they're not really uh well my kids were tasting wine about that age they do and actually we had uh Oh, we met this really nice woman from Germany one, one time we were traveling and she gave us this great idea. Her grandfather had bought a case of, of the vintage of his grandkids' birth years to save. And then at, at, you know, these big momentous birthdays throughout their life, 16, 18, 20, whatever, they would open some and celebrate. So I went out and did that, including some Cornos from 09, which cost wow. me a pretty penny. But we've got two, you know, Phenomenal. a case of 2009, a case of 2012. It's on the bottom of our wine fridge. And I, I had to write a note to myself, just, you know, this is Luca's wine, this is Nico's wine, <laughs> stay the hell away. That's cute. Yeah. That's really cute. And do they, they do like, like running in the vineyard and playing? They, and... they do, yeah. It gets a little bit worrisome because we have the occasional rattlesnake out, out in the vineyards. Yeah, but, wow. um, but no, they love it out there. We have a pond at the winery they love to go fishing at. So it's, I, I grew it's up like basically. It's like daddy's office. It's pretty fun. That's yeah. great. Yeah. My dad's office was a mess when I had to go see. He's a pharmacist, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you, what happened when you got to, uh, to Hearst? How did you find out about it? What did you do to, to make it work there? How did you just, you were at Hope? I, I, was about at, you? I was at Hope, and uh, it, it was kind of a little bit of the, uh, the Goldilocks tale. So I was at Hope, and, and my wife and I had our first son, who's now 10 and a half, and it's a big winery, and, and I was working a lot and traveling a fair amount in support of the brand, and it kind of got to be too big. And uh, so then I went to this real small little winery called Alta Kalina, and they're just the sweetest people, the Tillman family in Alta Kalina, yeah. or, uh, in Paso, and, and I love them and still keep in contact with them quite a bit. So I went over there for a little over three years, and, uh, and the whole Goldilocks thing, that kind of was, in the end, maybe a little bit too small. And then Hearst Ranch, we're sitting right around 18,000 cases is just right, so... I'm still able to coach two little league teams, and oh, that's so cool! I'm I'm really busy, you know, August through uh through not, early I hope November. You're not coaching soccer? I, no, I'm no. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have I'm nothing against player. soccer per se, but well, I, just, I do. I have a huge yeah, things against. Screw it. soccer then. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. Since you're a little league coach, I'm a, I was a high school hitting coach, and I taught I travel ball. I coached all that stuff for girls. I had three girls, so that's, okay. that was my my blessing. So, uh, but I was put on the high school baseball team as a hitting coach as well. Oh, nice. In Arcadia here. And the reason I have a problem with soccer is not because of the sport. Uh, I'm Armenian, so I'm going to have to cross it sooner or later. But 
It's that it it was the first youth sport that transcended all the boundaries of regular youth sports. So you could always count on you know playing baseball, and then you know, the summer comes, and then you play what well, football, and then basketball, and so soccer, and then just it's just part of the cycle. But all of a sudden, soccer had travel, and then ASO is huge, and now the girls, in my, in my case, the girls were you know, joining the team like three weeks into the season because the soccer season wasn't over yet, and their their travel coaches would tell them, "Don't do this, don't do that," because I need you back. And I'm like. It's their kids. Yeah, we're just supposed to have some fun, uh, and so uh, I used to. I did. I did everything I could as a coach. It was a very important lesson, not to take it out on the kid, not to in, not to have a prejudged opinion of the kid, because it's not their fault. Uh, like when they're late to practice, it's not their fault, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I would stop the kid and I say, "Hey, do me a favor and tell your parents to get you here on time, will you?" <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Because you end up being a babysitter, but make that's the parent okay. run a lap. <laughs> yeah, make, make the parent. There's somebody told me I can't remember what it was. It was a great, a great, uh, not penalty, but I forgot what it was. The other, I think what one of the coaches used to do. And I was president of Little League two for two years. Is they would make the other kids run <laughs> laps until the last person showed up. Oh, jeez! And that like <laughs> didn't work. It just didn't work. <laughs> well, that's great. So baseball's a great sport. All right. So you're, you're going to make wine at Hearst Ranch. Oh, tell me about the Hearst Ranch wine because I, the first time I tasted the Cab Franc, which was a few couple of years ago, I bought two cases just for my cellar alone, just so I could have it. And since I've sold it and put it in, uh, recently we have um, uh, an account with a sports agency and when they take on a new client and many many hockey players that you know basketball players baseball players they get a case of wine and it's valued around a thousand dollars it's curated by us and we started putting the Hearst Ranch Cabernet Franc until I ran out of it in there and because I just thought it was an interesting wine for somebody who's the only question they ask these potential uh, clients are what styles of wine do you like so whenever they say cabs or you know bordeaux varietals whatever i i we would put one of the hearst ranch wines in it so tell me is it connected to the castle uh william randolph hearst um how does all that play out so uh a local couple from paso robles named debbie and jim saunders they planted a state vineyard in 1992 and for the longest time they were selling their food off to other wineries um, but eventually in 2009 Steve Hurst, who is a great grandson of William Randolph Hurst, oh, wow. and he's the he's a VP for Hurst Corporation on the board of directors. He's he's a great great guy and you know, kind of a big deal. Well, yeah, I think I mean, like probably. Ron Burgundy, big deal. He, uh, Cornas kind of big deal. He, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he and and Jim and Debbie got together and they started this collaboration. So Hurst Ranch Winery. So our estate vineyards are on Jim and Debbie's property on on the northeast side of Paso, and then our tasting room is really just the most amazing tasting room I've ever seen. And I'm, I'm yeah. not just saying that because it's our tasting room. It's on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, San Simeon Cove, directly across the street from Hearst Castle. Wow. And it really, uh, you've been very complimentary about our wines and I appreciate that, but our wines taste even that much better when you're sitting there on a bluff over the ocean. So it's, we have oh, a pretty spectacular set. It. it looks, it's pretty, pretty darn good. So maybe, maybe that's the idea of terroir. Uh, besides the you know the planting and picking conditions the philosophy your philosophy i think has a lot to do with the terroir but certainly the experience of the wine has absolutely. a lot to do with the terroir absolutely yeah so we have this magical spot where people can come experience the wines um when things first started out we were just getting a lot of happenstance people that had been up at the castle and and came and hey look here's a you know a tasting room and a and a small restaurant but it's great as as we've been working really hard in the vineyard and the winery and we've been gaining some notoriety and and we still get those great happenstance consumers but we have people seeking us out, out so now which steve, is awesome steve hirsch steve hirsch hirsch um i mean it's the huge film philanthropy i, sus I suspect about the hurts they Foundation. are they're very gracious people yes yeah um, how many tours have you been on of the castle? <laughs> not surprisingly, not that many. I've only been at one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I've, I've I've got to do some kind of back back uh, behind the scenes stuff. Oh, that's which cool. Is they put a tasting room in there. That'd be really yeah. something, huh? <laughs> well, so the castle's now owned by the state. Oh, okay, so that'd be so a that there's I don't want to say there's unfettered access. I mean, yeah. certainly you can go to parts that uh, that the public doesn't get to go to with with the appropriate tour guide. but yeah. not like I have keys. No. Yes. <laughs> that wouldn't that be special that, that would be pretty cool yeah so i i i, I, was, I mentioned i thought i had seen uh, the structure but it's it's off the highway it's down towards the bluff which is it not is. that far it's, it's, but yeah i mean it's less than a quarter mile off of highway yeah. one on the west side so and, and you have you mentioned that you have a food truck coming which i think is fascinating because i 
because here I want to start some kind of tasting room experience. And I was afraid to have food. I don't want to start a restaurant. Gotcha. So who's 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 this guy that comes? This is... So there's a, an amazing couple in Paso Robles, and they own two restaurants, Il Cortile and La Cosecha, and they have the truck. And uh, you'll just have to take my word for it. It's the best food I've ever had of a food truck before. So they rotate the menu, up. and it's just delicious and fresh, and they basically have taken up residence at the uh, the tasting room. So... We so there's food. enough traffic to, oh, yeah. at the tasting room that you just have a full-time food truck there. Yep, they're there seven days a week. That's phenomenal. Uh, we're open 10 to 5. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so you can get an amazing meal, get the wine, eat and out by the ocean. They have these two restaurants in Paso as well. They, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's not connected to us in any way, shape, or form, except that they're, right. they're nice enough to carry our wines. Yeah, but, uh, well, that's good. <laughs> but yes, it's their, their food truck and their, their successful restaurant tours, so they certainly know what they're doing. Are they on the plaza? Uh, one of them is on 12th Street, and okay. one of them's on the plaza. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So I want to know then now that we were talking about organic and biodynamic, and, and sometimes I get worried when I bring the terms up, you know, natural wine, that this is going to be a stigma for the winemaker to say yes and no or not. It doesn't matter, I don't think, <clears throat> frankly, because it's your philosophy of how you're going to produce the best wine and present it to the consumer and deliver that experience, which I think you do an incredible job with presenting the, the east side of Paso Robles and like the Cabernet Franc and the Malbec, such wonderful varietal character. And that's really what you know we're looking for as consumer is, is this a good representation of what it's supposed to be? And I think it's incumbent of, of, on the winemaker and the, and the terroir uh, to use the terroir to do that. And not alter it so um but there is this conscientious movement and, I, and I, I, my listeners are probably tired of hearing this but i taste so much biodynamic undrinkable wine really i mean seriously i mean it's just like you made really? soccer face when you said that <laughs> oh. it's like really you're gonna sell this and and look at it and so there's some uh, ethereal experience about wine that should at least be palatable don't you think <laughs> I, I would, agree, kind of with, I would agree with that assessment yes and yeah. it's i certainly would say it's a noble pursuit to try and, and impact the land and your environment as little as possible and with that being said that is what we do um but by that same token if you're farming a vineyard organically or, or trying not to have any external inputs if you have something rise up how sustainable is it to have to drop your crop on the ground because it's full of powder or mildew because you didn't spray? Um, and and I've, Very important. I've seen that happen. I've rejected loads because of powder really? mildew. Really? Like a truckload of grapes come in and you're like, eh. Just not even pick it out of the vineyard. You can see it. Yep. And, and not to, I mean, that's someone that was making a damn good effort to, to be really, really yes. environmentally friendly. And right. I applaud them for that. Right. But it's not a great business model if that happens frequently. Well, I think that, I think, part of the conversation as well, we're in this business to make some money, which is very hard to do uh, in the wine business, let alone uh, uh, throw crops away. And so I think we discussed this earlier that if, if, if grapes come in that do have, or it's time to, it's, it's moist, uh, it's wet during that harvest. Um, we talk about picking at night or in the early morning so that it's a little cooler so that the potential for other uh, organisms and things to propagate uh, doesn't exist. But um, you know, eventually it's what you put in the bottle and it's got your name on it. And we want to make sure that that's a great representation of what it's supposed to be. So you have contracts with uh, how much estate fruit or most of it? We're in the midst of a, a massive replanting on our estate vineyard. We're really? just kind of okay. updating. We had some old varietals that <clears throat> when the vineyard was planted in 92 were, were in high demand. And, uh, and, and like what? Well, I mean, at the time, Petit Verdot, we, we had... Yeah, isn't that interesting? It's, it's tough using up 17 acres of Petit yeah. Verdot, let me tell wow. you. Wow, it's a lot. <laughs> but also, at the time they were planted, it wasn't exactly the most uh, scientifically driven endeavor. Yes. Uh, right. So the, the vineyard block was, you know, they were looking a little bit tired. So we've updated. Um, we actually have a new section of Petit Verdot. We planted some new Cab Franc. We're one of the few wineries now that has Carmenere planted, which is pretty darn cool. Wow, that's really interesting. So we had after we shaved off, see that. we have a one acre block of Carmenere now, and uh, so that'll that'll be interesting. I mean, I'd I'd love to be able to put some in bottle by itself one day, but if not, it'll be a fun blender to play. I with. don't think um, you saw my database. This uh, we we think we've tasted between ninety and a hundred thousand wines. There's probably fifty in that computer alone, than a fifty off site over the years. Um, I don't think I've ever tasted a domestic Carmenere. I haven't either. I'd have planted to look it an up. Acre. It'll be great. That'll be incredible yeah. to taste. <laughs> Can I be invited to the, yeah. the first thing on that? Um, so 
this is an expensive endeavor. And I had this conversation yesterday with a wine author uh, named Ed Masiana, and we, I wanted him to walk through the idea of you and I, you know, the Soren and Paul's famous wines. We're gonna we're gonna start from scratch, and we're gonna go up to Paso, and we're gonna go on the east side, and uh, I'm assuming it's slightly a little bit less money per acre than than the thing. And we're not gonna we're not gonna buy planted vineyard. We're gonna buy raw land, and we're gonna plant it. Uh, and we're going to wait how long before we get our first crop to make wines with? That's, yeah, that's that's decent. Figure figure five years before so you have five years. So we've tied uh, up all this cash. Yep. For five years, and we're not even sure what we have yet. And we don't have a fermentation tank. We don't have a facility. We don't have anything. <laughs> Is it really possible to in the Paso area? And I had this conversation with somebody in Armenia, and you would think that Armenia would have a low cost of entry to do this, and it's getting to the point where that's not even possible probably to start from scratch and think you're going to make money at it. Um, and so it's got to be expensive to tear up a vineyard and replant it. And it is. It is. There are some some programs that will help if you have an old vineyard that's not producing. I mean, we certainly pay. Oh, do they do we, so? We, well, state we, programs? It, it behooves the, the government to, to have producing acreage right, because right, right. that winds up producing revenue in other ways. So we certainly utilize some programs to help get the... Uh, you know, some of our older vineyard blocks out and, and get in some new stuff that's going to produce a robust crop here. Is that a state or federal thing? State. State thing. Yeah. Well, at least they're doing something right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's creating fire breaks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, when you replant this vineyard, you're going to, um, we talked about certification for organic and biodynamic, and those are two more buzzwords that, are, that we were talking about earlier. But um, the sustainable part of this, which is, well, we try not to. Uh, we try to pay good wage. We try to recycle the mulch, or we try to take the must, and we try to put it, whatever you do with it. Um, and it, you said something about your kids playing in the vineyard. And one of the most common thing, not common, one of the most interesting things I hear from wine makers all over the world, when I ask them about their farming techniques, and my microphone's sinking as I'm going down the thing, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, is I don't want those things in the vineyard because my kids are playing out there. Right? They're digging holes and they're playing with their trucks or whatever. So what's your general philosophy about the, the vineyards that you do business with and the stuff that you're playing now? It's, it really reflects the, the winemaking philosophy. It's simplicity. Really, it's if you need to, to interject, if there is a, something that could be a big problem with the grapes, do it in the most responsible way possible. Right. But as far as just being on a spray cycle for powdery mildew, you know, we're not on a three cycle or a three week cycle where we just automatically spray because that's what the package right, says. Right. We're walking the vineyard. We're taking a look. Um, you know, there are clues that'll let you know if something's going a little bit sideways. And so we, we really pay attention. And, you know, there's an interesting book called the third plate. It's by Dan Barber, the, uh, the famous food farm to table, uh, chef in New York. And he talks about, um, he takes, he starts with American agriculture and primarily wheat and he ends up in, um, different countries with farmed fish he also talks about Iber about iberian pigs and and foie gras from geese that aren't force fed it's just based on what they eat and so but he, the argument he makes is first of all it's very hard to to feed the world organically because it's just it can't produce as much but besides that he says a good farmer and I mean, this is a question that Maybe you want to answer too, but it's just something interesting. He says, a good farmer can go into the field and there in the South 40, he says, gee, you know, we have mustard plants growing here. So we're short magnesium or we're short nitrogen or whatever the chemicals out there. But down the road, we have a different weed growing and we now need to treat that, that part of the vineyard or that part of the farm with, with something else. And, and his argument is, you know, they, and you don't have this luxury with, with grapes as much, but they cross plant. So if they, if wheat is growing now and they find that that part of the vineyard uh, farm is short on nitrogen, they plant cross plant sugar peas or something that's gotcha. high nitrogen. Right. And I thought that was a fascinating, um, look at it. And I don't know about the vineyards like that. I've had conversations with winemakers where like our vineyards are so rustic as grass and weeds and spiders and you know, all kinds of stuff. We have, for a couple of years running now, we have planted a really, really aggressively rooting variety of daikon radish in really? our, our crop rows. And what happens is it's, it's a dual purpose. So it, it seeds itself and it's just this long, long kind of cone shaped radish, but it penetrates deep into the soil. And what happens is then kind of before bud break late in the spring, 
we'll go ahead and we won't spray it, but we'll mow it. We'll chop the top off of them. Really? And that kills them. As they decompose, the void they leave in the soil leaves the, the soil profile very, very open for water to penetrate. And then they decompose and release nitrogen into the soil. Oh, so we, fascinating. Yeah, so, we found that through, uh, you know, doing some research and it's awesome. And they're absolutely just complete bonus, gorgeous. When the radishes go to bloom, you can, but because they're long and stringy, they're yeah. not, they're kind of a pain in the ass. With a little butter, Mark, you'll, yeah. radish bunny, okay. But uh, when they go to flower, it looks like there's just snow in the vineyards. It's really cool. These beautiful white That's flowers really just cool. kind of carpeting the hillside. So... Is that selective based on you know where you think you need it, or is you just no? Just, we we did all of our all of our row middles because we have some really really steep hills, so it's good for erosion control. But then at the same time, opening that soil up, letting water penetrate, and then adding nitrogen, oh, all those are good things. What a, I've never heard that one. It's yeah. a new one. So well, I mean, I, I, down, I somewhat doubt we're the first ones to do it, but <laughs> no, yeah, but... it was it was something that we were really happy with the first year. So we're uh, we've added a little bit of barley in since just because we're, we don't want it to become a monoculture out there because yeah, right. the, the vines are dormant at that t point. But yeah, we're, it's, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, the, dormant vines, well, we were, <laughs> the most passionate thing I've ever seen when it comes to vineyard management is Millbrook, New York. And we were, I was there on a totally separate reason, uh, but it wasn't wine related actually. I bought the, the original Wine Society of America in 1994. It was gone bankrupt. But it was in winter, it was in the dead of winter, and I was going by the Millbrook Vineyards, it was Millbrook Vineyards, that was the name of it, and there's a guy out there in a dry suit, you know, clamped, was clamped around your ankles and your thing, and he's pruning in like this much snow, like three feet of snow. I'm like, why? I mean, the wind, <laughs> wind's aren't any good, really. <laughs> and why are you wasting your time? But it's just the passion, the labor of love to, to make sure, he, you know, he gets the crop next year. Anyway, I don't know if you had New York wines, they're just not that great. Um, so what's new? What's going to be new for the Hearst Ranch? You've got this new vineyard. You're going to yeah, let's talk about some of these wines. The Cabernet Franc, which has been one of my favorite Cabernet Francs, domestic Cabernet Francs ever. Um, and you have some juice from Monterey in your Chardonnay. Yes, we do. So I mean, there certainly are some people in Pastor Ovals that are growing Chardonnay that makes nice wine. Um, but Monterey is, is really close yeah, stylistically, to Stylistically, they're totally different. So. Well, yeah, stylistically they're different. But, you know, Monterey is it's, to get the fruit, it's an hour drive which I've driven that far south to get, you know, yeah, right. red. So, yeah, sure. No, so for us, we'll continue sourcing a good deal of Chardonnay from Monterey County because it's, it's great fruit and it's there. Um, it's we have wine. another wine actually that's not here. We do a secondary Chardonnay. That's a, it's a higher end label and actually carries a Central Coast Appalachian. And that's mm. because we get about half of it from Southern San Luis Obispo County and another half of it from Northern Santa Barbara. Wow, that's interesting. So we call it Central Coast, but it's just, I mean, two awesome vineyards and, yeah. and again, dealing with sandy soil and clay soil. So it's, it gets some really neat expressions. Um, things are going really good. We're excited having the new tasting room space. Yeah. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we opened up a tasting location at the winery in Paso. So for those of you coming to visit uh, Paso, 7310 North River Road, which is an awesome spot. We have uh, for the that's first the time. Road. Is that the road to the airport? No, Not so quite. that's Airport Road is. Oh, airport. Yeah. Yep. Well, hi, gee. Airport so it's it's road, yeah. It's, I mean, it's about figure <laughs> a mile to the to the west of Airport Road on on River Road. We now have a tasting spot at the winery that's right up to our barrel room, and it's really cool. That's the first time we've had that in the ten year history of the winery. So people can come up to the winery now, and you know, depending on the workload, if they catch me down there, we'll go stick a thief in some barrels and and goof oh, off fun. in that regard. But I'm really excited about the new vineyard planting. So, kind of shifting our focus a little bit more towards a Bordeaux driven winery. Uh, we're going to have six noble Bordeaux varietals, red varietals on the property, that's, which is pretty cool. That's pretty so, cool. We well, have this one, the point. We have the point. Yeah. So that's, a that's a blend of five. I endeavor to do that every time is, is if I can do it without compromising quality, try and sneak in all five varieties that we have. Um, but once we have Carmenere producing, I think that's going to be, you know, it's interesting. More depth. You, you were probably around then, but, um, and I went through the archives of my dad's newsletters and I started here in 1988. There was so much Italian varietals back in Paso in those days, Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo the Martin Brothers. Um, you know, there are a lot of wineries that are gone now, but they were a lot of Sangiovese and they're unusual thing. Uh, do you see that anymore? And like you go up Highway 46, I think Martin and Wayrick was there for a while. And now I think it's San Antonio and, and the hotel back there. What's going on with the tourism in Paso? And I, I suppose it's going up since you just opened the tasting room. And, you know. it, yeah, it's, it's going gangbusters. I mean, they're building hotels i don't want to say it's an alarming rate but we're building hotels every year wow um so the influx of people we get on the weekends is, is pretty dramatic 
and downtown is almost unrecognizable just every weekend there's no point we're lucky enough to live within walking distance but you don't even try and drive just walk down to the park or walk down to dinner or something because there's there's cars and there's tourists and it's great it's bringing a lot of people and a lot of notoriety notoriety no to our area you say. i like to i got to get back up there yeah uh, stop at the outlets you know on the way, on the way up and uh, and go to mcphee's and see try some of the new foods it's been a great pleasure having you here, Soren. I really enjoyed catching up on what's going on at Paso and, and Hertz Ranch Winery, and we're going to bring some of the wines in. I, I think I, I had great response from these guys uh, who are curating this um, athlete's box. Nice. And I think it's just really fun to have to show different parts of California, and I think it's a great representation of what's going on out there. You're doing a great job. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to have you in here. Thank you very much, Paul. We appreciate it too. Cheers. Thanks.